welcome back to ENA 788M hands on autonomous aerial robotics uh, in the last part of this lecture we talked about the different components which make an autonomous quad rotor right so now what we will talk about is how do we hack a uh, off the shelf bebop 2 which is made by a company called parrot in france and then we will also talk about how you can make your own research quad rotor from bare bone components which we talked about in the last lecture right let's dive right into it so the first question is why use a parrot bebop 2 right so it's low cost and you can buy a refurbished version for 220 dollars be aware that the bebop 2 is not produced anymore parrot does not make it it's replaced by a new platform called the parrot anafi which we are going to talk about later uh, it also comes with a position hold mode by default so like as soon as you buy the bebop and you press the on button you connect it with your phone and you say take off it can just hold its position right so it has all the sensor suits and everything all the competitions built in so it makes life very easy for autonomy next it gives you a nice little api which you can control using wi-fi so you can use a companion pc on board with wi-fi or you can use a pc which is off board like your laptop and you can connect through wi-fi right so like we said before it has an open source api which parrot built so this was mainly targeted for developers for iOS and Android, but it's been adapted by the community to use to be used for like in C++ and Python and so on. Right. So like we said before, it's hacked extensively by community because of its cost effectiveness for autonomous operation. It's one of the cheapest, not the cheapest, but one of the cheapest quad rotors you can buy, which is very stable and has all the sensors packed in. Right. So here are some of the uh, uh, community based APIs which are based on the Parrot original API. So you have this thing called a Bebop Autonomy uh, which is for ROS and uh, you have uh, we have our own in-house in gap flight framework which builds on top of Bebop Autonomy to give you more higher level commands for visual surveying and stuff like that and you have the unofficial Bebop hacking guide which talks about how you can retune your, tune your gains, change a few sensor parameters inside and how do you change the telnet modes and so on, which we are going to talk about later in tomorrow's lab session, right? And you also have this thing called a Paparazzi UAV, which is basically an open source framework developed by TU Delft. And it basically, uh, it's like a complete operating system written from ground up, which can basically let you access all the sensor data and everything. The sort of, one of the major problems with the Paparazzi UAV is that anything you want, you sort of have to implement. And it's like very, hacker friendly but it's not like as polished as let's say the parrot api right cool now uh, we want to now see what the bebop 2 motor specifications are we talked about how to read the motor specifications before in the last part of this lecture so each motor is of 18 millimeter diameter and the stator height is 6 millimeter so it becomes an 1806 motors but 1806 motor but to get the kv rating we have to do some thrust bench testing so a thrust bench looks like this it's a blue color turnigi this is the blue color turnigi one costs about 140 150 170 dollars and you basically plug in your motor to it and you say you can use the dial on the bottom with the black one and you can turn it around and it can vary the speeds and this will give you a nice little plot of how much thrust is being produced how much current is being drawn and things like that right So once we sort of take the values from the Turnigy test bench and we plot it up in Excel or whatever your favorite graphing program, it like you get these set of plots, right? So the test was conducted at 12.4 amps, which is like the maximum limit uh, the 3S can be charged to. Uh, and uh, so we have a throttle versus thrust, which is basically with 0% to 100% throttle. It's almost like a second order curve in increase. So notice that this is not linear as you might think it would be, right? And you have throttle versus RPM, which is a linear curve. And th this is as the throttle is increasing, the RPM is increasing linearly, right? And uh, you have throttle versus current on, which is again like a second order curve, and it's increasing with the amount of throttle, right? 
and you'll see that at max it draws about seven and a half amps right um, not seven and a half like about seven to seven and a half amps right and throttle versus versus efficiency and notice that the efficiency of the motor drops as you increase in throttle right cool and so the generally all these quad rotors are designed to operate or like take off at about 50 percent thrust where it's like really really efficient right so from these numbers if we crunch it and then we can we divide the maximum rpm divided by the voltage we applied we get about 980 kV right so our motor is close to an off the shelf 1806 980 kV so notice that 980 kV motors at 1806 do not exist Parrot has made this specifically to be very efficient and give you the best battery life that's why we get about when you just buy the bebop it gives you about 20 25 minutes of battery life right cool and now let's talk about the sensors the bebop 2 has right it comes with a suit of sensors uh, it has a front-facing fisheye camera which has a built-in uh, digital stabilization. It's not an optical one, it's a digital one, so it crops into the smaller area and then it stabilizes it around. And this can stream data over Wi-Fi at 30 hertz. So if you just need a Bebop and you want to use it for like basic data processing and you can do an off-board control, you can literally just use the camera directly. right? And the next thing is uh, it comes with a down-facing distance sensor and camera. So in this case, it has uh, a Max Botics like sonar and the camera is a low resolution camera, right? So this is sort of analogous to the PX4 flow sensor, which is extensively used in the community. And then we have an IMU, which is on board. This is shown in this black little box. Uh, the black box is just for uh, insulating it from the magnetic interference of the motors and stuff like that. And we have a GPS and a compass without which this Bebop will not arm, right? And it's so it can function both indoors and outdoors really well. So now uh, we are introducing the PRG Husky, which is a platform we built in-house after hacking a Bebop 2. This is targeted towards research at the, uh, at the mini quad rotor scale, so about 360 size. So notice that many Bebops 2 were harmed in the making of this PRG Husky, we have sacrificed quite a few of them, and it's obviously needless to say that your warranty will be void if you have a Bebop 2, if you ever do this to your Bebop 2, right? So our PRG Husky looks like this. It has a bunch of stuff on it, and let's go through each of them one by one, right? So all the things shown in blue are the Bebop's original parts, which we have retained. So we retain the uh, original 1806 kV motors because they're efficient and nice, and we also retain the Bebop to mainboard ESCs and down facing camera and sonar because it already gives us all the position hold and everything so we don't have to redo the whole thing right so then we retain the GPS and compass like we said before the Bebop 2 will not arm without GPS and compass so we sort of have to retain it though we want to just use it indoors right and then we build our own custom chassis anything in red shown here is basically the custom additions we made so the 2mm carbon fiber plate is cut using water jet and we make this chassis, right? And then we have a leopard imaging, uh, imaging monocular camera for the front facing thing. And uh, we have a Tara stereo camera on the down facing side. And then we have an Intel up upboard in which all the computations can be run. And then we also have landing legs which are made of onyx, which is uh, nylon infused with carbon fiber shreds, right? So the total takeoff weight is 770 grams, including the original Bebop battery. So let's go over the additions we made to the Bebop 2. So like we said before, we added an Intel upboard, which is used for computing on board. And it has an Atom processor, which is reasonably powerful enough for embedded computers, right? And we have a front facing leopard imaging monocular camera, which is used for any perception we want to do on the front side of the quad rotor. And we have a down facing Tara stereo camera and it also co comes with an IMU. This is nice because you can run a stereo VIO on it. Uh, stereo VIO using this sensor suit, right? And it's pretty light and nice, small. So yeah, the Intel upboard, like we said before, comes with the Atom X5 processor running at 1.92 gigahertz. It comes with 4 GB RAM and 32 GB of storage. And it needs about uh, 15 watts of power to run. It weighs about 80 grams with an active heatsink and the size and costs are given in the slide. So next, let's uh, talk about the front-facing camera. The uh, front-facing leopard imaging camera comes with an Aptina MT9M021 1x3 inch RGB global shutter color sensor 
and the maximum resolution is 1280 by 960 at 30 hertz and it supports external tri trigger and software trigger and it draws about 170 milliamps at 5 volts right weighs about 22 grams with the lens and the size is pretty small it's 26 by 26 by 38 and the cost is given here right and uh, next let's talk about the down facing stereo camera again it comes with an on semi mt 9v024 1 by 3 inch monochrome global shutter sensors and two of them they are hardware synchronized which is awesome because that's what we want for a stereo setup has a baseline which is the distance between the sensor centers is about 60 millimeters it has a nice little six axis imu to it and the depth sensing range where it actually works well is about 50 centimeters to three centimeters which is half a meter to three meter which is about the height where we would fly our quarter to that right and weighs about 28 and a half grams when we remove the casing but including the lens so that's pretty uh, light for a stereo camera and so and it costs about three hundred dollars right so for the other thing what we do is from the PRG Husky we remove certain things from the Bebop 2 we remove the central cross or the frame which the original Bebop came with because we are replacing that with the carbon fiber chassis we remove the front camera and the nose because we replace that with the leopard imaging global shutter camera and we also remove the feet because we have better landing gear with the onyx 3d printed one so for the PRG Husky frame, uh, we experimented with a bunch of stuff before we finalized on what we wanted to use. We started by doing a 3 millimeter carbon fiber, which we got water cut using this Protomax uh, water jet cutter. And it weighed about 115 grams and costed about, us about $48 for the whole thing, right? So it was expensive and pretty heavy. So then we used Onyx with 25% infill. Uh, this weighed about 50 grams, which is like more than less than half and it costed us about $28, which is like about half the price, right? But the problem with this was that this was too flexible. So we did not end up using this. Uh, then we finally settled upon two millimeter carbon fiber, which weighed about 84 grams, which is somewhere in between and costed us the same as the three millimeter carbon fiber, right? So yeah, and the frame eventually looks something like this. So when we printed the Onyx, it was too flexible and uh, we basically could not uh, do anything and it would basically flap around like this. We were impressed by how well the Bebop controller could actually stabilize it. So that's like a fun experiment for anybody who wants to do research in this. Right, uh, like we talked about before, the landing gear is 3D printed from Onyx using this Mark Forge 3D printer. Uh, Onyx is basically nylon infused with carbon fiber shreds. Uh, and we use a 16% infill with zigzag infill pattern and we found that to be the strongest one with enough give that it will break before any other part of the quarter rotor breaks. Right. Now the question is, we talked all this stuff about why use a Bebop 2 to make the PRG Husky. Let's talk a few points about why not use a Parrot Bebop 2, right? So, like we said before, it's end of life. It's replaced by the new Parrot Anafi. Parrot does not make the Bebop 2 anymore, so you can only buy it refurbished. So it's not like exactly the best idea. And the IMU data at the in the Bebop 2 is limited to 5 hertz. That's why we added the Tara camera, which has a separate IMU. So if you just want to use the monocular camera and you want to do a VIO, you cannot. You still have to add a separate IMU because this IMU only works at 5 hertz and there's enough latency that it's kind of useless to use that data right and the payload is limited to about 350 grams when you have the battery remember that we put a lot of stuff we are effectively left with about uh, 50 to 70 grams of payload so we cannot change the attitude controller what i mean by that is it runs a pid controller inside and you cannot change what that pid you can change the gains of the pid but not PID to a model predictive controller or an LQR or an LQG controller. So, so here are some ideas for the next platform, some possible upgrades and modifications we can do to the PRG Husky maybe. So Parrot Anafi is a, has a better API and more powerful motors, maybe we can hack that. Remember that Parrot Anafi does not have enough payload as the Bebop because it's a smaller drone and it only weighs 330 grams when you buy it. So you can replace the carbon fiber with dragon plate which is carbon fiber with birch core for some weight savings 
so it can give you about 30 percent of weight savings and then you can also use a different computer rather than the intel upboard such as the nvidia jetson tx2 for running some neural network stuff or deep learning right so here is a list of materials you would need to build your own prg husky costs about hundred thousand fifty dollars uh, if you add in batteries and other chargers and stuff it goes up to fourteen hundred dollars right so a uh, complete step-by-step -step instruction on how to build your own uh, PRG Husky from scratch, from ordering the materials to getting water cut, 3D printed, and putting the screws and everything. Refer to this uh, GitHub wiki, which is under the name PRG Flight, uh, which has a bunch of other hardware things as well. Right. So once you build it and you download the Parrot Free Flight app and you test it out, so you will have something like this. Notice that we are testing for all the different axes and notice how well the bebop control actually handled though we can retune it to make it more aggressive and nicer. Right. So now let's uh, build our own research quad rotor and uh, the reasons as to why not to use a PRG Husky. Right. So it has a limited sensors use. Currently the PRG Husky has three cameras and an IMU. If you want to add more cameras to make a spherical field of view or if you want to add a stereo camera in the front, that's currently not possible because of the weight limitations and the space constraints. So like we said before, the payload is limited to about 50 grams after everything is on. So, and you cannot change the inner loop controller easily. You can tune it, but you cannot change it. You can rewrite the whole thing using Paparazzi UAV, but that's not exactly easy. And uh, this whole platform is not made for aggressive flight, right? It's made for like small indoor experiments, indoor and outdoor, but definitely not for something you want to do like with drone racing or something like that. You cannot do super fast aggressive maneuvers with this platform because it's pretty sluggish and the choice of controller is not the best for that. Then uh, the question arises, can we change the motors on the PRG Husky to make it better, right? So to to answer this question, we actually tried it and we put a T motor AR2213920 kV motors on it, which we thought is pretty close in the kV rating to the Bebop original motors, but the motors were a lot bigger, so a lot more punch. And we also put in like big propellers, like 9545. And we also mounted this whole thing on a bigger frame, like S500, which we bought off online but uh, it would not take off so what we did is we had to cut the propellers down like using literally a scissors to seven and a half inches and then it would actually fly and this is what it looked like So we actually flew that in the video mode. When we put it on the sport mode, things were not exactly the best and certain things happened. A few moments later. Right. We burnt the MOSFETs on the PRG Husky. So here's an image of how it looks. So we sort of found out by looking into the data sheet that these MOSFETs are not rated for more than 15 amps, like surge current. So we hope that this mo these motors do a lot more. Than 15 amps right and it's some safety built in and it kicked up and it basically burned these mosfets so this computer was this uh, parrot computer was basically unusable we had to throw it out and buy a new bebop so you don't want to do this especially during your research because it gets expensive and it's a pain to keep ordering stuff again so now if you want to build your own research quad rotor like the first question i'm going to ask you is what size do you want the quad rotor to be right it can go anywhere from 130 to 450 and I've taken two sizes in between just to get a reference. So 210 millimeters and 360 millimeters. Remember like from the last video that this is the diagonal length from motor center to the motor center 
so 130 just 130 millimeters just means the motor center to motor center distance diagonally is 130 millimeters right so the first thing is let's uh, recap what we talked about about the flight controllers the racing flight controllers use generally one of these three flight stacks either the beta flight or clean flight or the butterfly and here are the most common racing flight controllers the nazi 32 cc3d and luminear f4eio the best part about the luminear f4eio is that it also comes with four uh, 15 or 20 amp scs so you can just put this on your quad rotor and you don't need another board it also comes with a beck so which makes it nice so you can power up stuff from this directly so if you are generally building for autonomy the some of the flight controllers you would want to flight stacks you want to run is the px4 autopilot or the autopilot and it's supported in the pixoc 2 cube which is huge uh, the pix falcon which is smaller but with limited functionality and the pix racer which has even limited functionality and it's even lighter right so the onboard computers can run one of these three architectures it's either the intel x86 which is what our atom board is and this is the most closest to your own laptop or your pc right it's the exact same architecture so most of the code base will directly run then you have arm which is supposed to be more efficient and uh, all the embedded computers are generally made of arm like the intel upboard is an exception right so arm based computers are super effective and it gives you more battery life consumes lesser power but the problem is not all the code bases will directly translate so if you don't use ARM optimizations, the code base will run pretty slow, right? And there's a new emerging trend called RISC-V, which is basically an architecture where people have written the instruction set from ground up. And it's like if you want, a, let's say, a chip tomorrow for autonomy, you can build your own instruction set. So that will be super optimized. So it's sort of like the uh, to-go solution in the future and for products, right? So that's, that's a nice thing to have. Though remember that it's not that easy to source risk five boards right now. So, but maybe five, 10 years from now, you can maybe buy this and start using them, right? So in this slide, I'm just showing you a list of components you would want to use if you're building your own nano quad rotor, right? I'm not going to go through each of them for the brevity of this video. Same thing here for a micro quad rotor. Here are the list of parts you would want to buy and build your own. Uh, same thing for a mini quad rotor again. And the last thing is for a standard quad rotor, right? To summarize, as a rule of thumb, if you have a frame size less than 150 millimeter, you want to use a propeller less than three inches in diameter, a motor size less than 1306, and the KV higher rating than 3000, right? So for the frame size 180 millimeters, you would use a four inch prop, an 1806 motor, and 2600 KV. For a 210 millimeter quad rotor, you would use a five inch prop, a uh, motor varying from 2205, uh, 2204 to 2206, there's 2205 as well. And you can use motor KVs from 2300 to 2600. For a 250 millimeter quad rotor, you would use a six inch prop size, 2204 to 2206 motor as before. And uh, you'd use the KV rating to be lower, which is 2000 to 2300. This is to compensate for the increase in prop size, right? And uh, for a 350 millimeter quad rotor, you can use a 7 inch prop size with a 2208 motor and a 1600 kV rating. For a 450 millimeter quad rotor, you can use either 8 to 10 inch props, so motor size bigger than or equal to 2212, and motor kV less than or equal to 1000. Right? If you notice, our Bebop motors are somewhere in between. That's because it's engineered perfectly for the best battery life. So it's a 980 kV motor, which is supposed to be for a 450 millimeter quad, but the size is at about uh, uh, five and a half inch props which is somewhere in between right so that's that's the thing about it and it's a two two it's a one eight oh six motor right so it's somewhere in between and it's a perfectly engineered product i think now you have all the skill sets you would need to go build your own autonomous quad order and happy autonomous flying see you next time bye